can't decide whether it's all of the books of the OT that come out of periods of upheaval and turmoil, or if it's just the ones that I'm interested in. Just the ones that you like. <laughs> I did. I mean, this quarter I actually had a student say, I was about seven years old, and I, I said to my mom, I was angry at God, and my mom says, you're not allowed to be angry at God. He's like, you can't. No, you can't say that. Um, and I'm like, oh, no, it's very biblical to be angry at God. Right. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I'm Dr. Carly Crouch, and I am David Allen Hubbard, professor of Old Testament here at Fuller Seminary. I'm reflecting today on the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah comes to us from the final decades of the 7th century and the first few decades of the 6th century of the centuries before Christ. It arises out of a period of great turmoil, great upheaval, great uncertainty. This is a context in which the great empires of the ancient world are in a period of flux and transition. The Assyrians are falling away, and yet there are a number of decades in which the Babylonians and the Egyptians are struggling for control over the area that includes Judah and Jerusalem. And so the kings and the leaders of Judah are trying to discern what the right path forward in the midst of the maelstrom might be. Speaking into this context, we hear of a prophet called Jeremiah. Now, the book of Jeremiah, if you try to sit down and read it, is quite difficult. It doesn't read like a normal sort of book that we might be used to. It contains poetry that is full of judgment and condemnation of the people for their failures of social justice, their falling away from God. It contains poetry of hope, looking forward to restoration after judgment in chapters 30 and 31. It contains oracles against foreign nations. It contains sermons that go on about and explicate the various sins of the people and explain why it is that judgment is looming. And it also contains a number of stories about the prophet Jeremiah, about the prophet's interactions with the kings of Judah, the prophet's interaction with other prophets who proclaim a different word, and the various struggles of Jeremiah as he attempts to convey the will of God. How do we make sense of these various different kinds of material and the fact that the book of Jeremiah seems at times very chaotic and disordered? There have been a number of different ways of trying to think about how to make sense of this book. But one of the most interesting ways of thinking about the book's disorder and feelings of chaos recently has been to reflect on the way that this disorder, this chaotic feeling, might reflect the response of the community to various kinds of upheaval and trauma. Recovery from trauma includes trying to get to grips with and to trying to incorporate traumatic events and experiences into a coherent story. And so in particular, one of the very interesting things that scholars have been thinking about with the book of Jeremiah recently is how the book's particular interest in Jeremiah's life compared to, for example, Isaiah or Amos, about whom we know relatively little. The book of Jeremiah is exceptionally interested in Jeremiah's life. And we've been reflecting on how that reflects an attempt to use the life of Jeremiah and telling the story of the life of Jeremiah as a way of beginning to make sense of what has happened to the people. The people, the audience of the book of Jeremiah, like those of the book of Ezekiel and other works from this period, are ultimately uh, those who have undergone great upheaval, great uh, experience of displacement as these final decades of the kingdom of Judah give way into a period of dislocation, of diaspora, and of exile. And so this book is speaking to that experience of dislocation, of disorder, and of disruption. There are two key parallels that the book makes between the life of Jeremiah and, first, the life of the people collectively, and second, to God. 
And so on the one hand, Jeremiah and Jeremiah's life is seen as moving in parallel to with the experiences of the people more widely. So for example, Jeremiah is in the city as it is laid siege to by the Babylonians and experiences its final destruction and the aftermath of that. And Jeremiah, we're told, goes into Egypt with a number of those who are fleeing before the Babylonian army. And so on the one hand, we have this parallel between the life of Jeremiah and the life of the people. And we might think about how this story of Jeremiah's life and reflecting on how certain actions and certain events, certain decisions in the life of the people have led to certain consequences helps the people, helps the reader, helps the listener to the book make sense of these terrible things that have happened. At the same time, the book makes a really important parallel between Jeremiah and God. So Jeremiah and the words of Jeremiah that Jeremiah speaks to the people are understood to be the words of God conveyed through the prophet. And so the way that the people respond to the prophet is seen as equivalent to and as standing in for the way that they respond to God. And so when the people re reject, when the people reject Jeremiah, that's understood as constituting a rejection of, of God. When the people reject the prophet whom God has sent, that they are in effect rejecting God. And so we see this connection between Jeremiah and God. And one of the really amazing ways that this comes out is that we see the suffering that Jeremiah expresses um, as he tries to fulfill his calling, his ministry, that this in certain places elides in a really powerful way with the suffering of God at the people's rejection. So again, the rejection of the prophet is the rejection of God. And so we see, for example, in chapter 8, we hear the words, My joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Hark the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? The harvest is ended, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people I am hurt. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Depending on the translation of the Bible that you're using, the Bible might editorial notes in your text might suggest that these are the words of the prophet, or they might suggest that they're the words of God. And one of the things that's quite remarkable is it's quite possible to read this passage as either the words of the prophet or the words of God. And that's because of this very close connection that the book of Jeremiah makes between the prophet and God. Finally, Jeremiah's suffering is one of the things that I think speaks to many people as we read this particular part of scripture. Jeremiah suffers greatly as he tries to fulfill the call that he has received from God. And one of the striking things about Jeremiah's struggle is that Jeremiah is not afraid to be angry at God, to call out God, to call out to God and to protest at what God has, has been asking Jeremiah to do and the consequences that that has brought, out, brought about in his life. Jeremiah is, of sorts, a license to protest, a license to be angry at God. And it seems to me quite often in our churches, in our communities, we're rather afraid to be angry at God or afraid to cry out to God in protest of what we are suffering. In the book of Jeremiah, the figure of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, like, for example, the book of Job and the book of Psalms, gives us the space and the ability to express even our darkest and deepest uh, distress to God who is able to absorb all of those things.